Thank you very much for having me and thank you for uh, this great opportunity to talk here uh, in the run-up to the Irish presidency. <laughs> now, uh, we only have 15 minutes, so let me kind of give one of my first big messages up front, which is I really think if we, if we want to make this, this union, this euro area really successful, we need a significant leap forward in terms of federalization of, of our policies. Uh, that includes uh, a stronger federal decision-making uh, authority, more risk sharing, um, and of course also the, uh, the ability to square um, the austerity policies at a national level with some offsetting transfers from, uh, from a Eurozone level. Now for all this, I think we will, will, we will have to have treaty changes and I, I, I think they, they will be unavoidable. Uh, Barroso, even the Commission President, has now talked about, about treaty change. Um, now I think this, this will come um, and, uh, and, and I don't see, uh, see a way out of this. The question is of course when and what is the best time to do it. Um, now more, more narrowly in my presentation, I, I want to kind of focus in particular on the, on the banking union, pro, um, uh, banking union uh, part of, uh, of the current discussion. Now, um, when we talk about banking union, I think the idea um, of fiscal risk sharing is really a central one, and also the idea of um, a, a greater centralization of decision-making power is absolutely central. And on both lines, um, there's a big discussion at the moment, which is a central discussion um, which essentially is a discussion about federalism, but it is also a discussion about a central discussion about how to make this banking union successful. Now, let me move to kind of my, my motiv motivating slide here, which basically says that the, 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 the problems in the banking system that we are currently observing are really at the core of the current crisis. We have a very serious fragmentation of the financial system in the euro area, now, some people say this, this, this fragmentation has stopped since the summer, um, thanks to the OMT policy of, of the ECB. Now, let me show you here a graph which uh, gives the, um, basically the risk that is um, in, in the sovereign, in the non-financial corporate sector, and in the financial corporate sector, the risk premium that, that, can, uh, that corporations has, have to pay. Now, what you see here is obviously you do see an improvement since the summer uh, in, in terms of the risk, yet the risk levels and the risk, uh, the, the risk premium that corporations have to pay and finan financial corporations have to pay is very, very high. Uh, here, this is Italy, the same holds for Spain. Now, let me compare this to Germany, um, where you see that um, the rates are much, much lower in Germany. In other words, what we have in the Eurozone at the moment even after the policy announcements of the ECB, we have a very serious fragmentation where the conditions for financing are very different across the Eurozone, uh, which means that um, the same exact same corporation located on one side of the border will have very different conditions for access to credit than uh, uh, the, same the same corporation on the other side of the border. And in other words, the fragmentation that we are seeing in the financial market is leading to a real economic fragmentation uh, where um, basically economic activity um, is, um, uh, is, is favored in some parts of, of the area and in other parts it's really disadvantaged. Um, and this means that um, basically um, we have, starting from the, the sovereign bond fragmentation, the financial fragmentation, we have a serious real economic fragmentation. Now, the, the idea of the banking union is basically to um, get rid of this, this high correlation. So the, what the banking union wants to achieve is basically uh, to reduce or to bring the correlation between sovereign risk and um, financial risk, so banking risk, to zero. So to break the vicious circle between banks and sovereigns. So instead of having a correlation of close to one, you want to have a correlation of zero. That's the beauty of being an academic. You just say, we bring down the correlation. Now, um, the, uh, the heads of states basically say in their June summit uh, conclusion, uh, we affirm that it is imperative to break the vicious circle between banks and, and sovereigns. Um, now, of course, the big question is, um, this was the decision in, in June. What have we achieved today? Um, and, and, and I think we, we, um, we need to talk about the, the different elements of the banking union and, and understand 
on what fronts have we made progress uh, or have we not made progress and how much. Now, let me first start by saying uh, if this banking union is to be successful, it needs to be a comprehensive banking union. We cannot have a banking union that's, that consists only of a common supervision. The banking union requires common supervision, a common resolution, and a common fiscal backstop um, that, that backs up, um, backs up um, uh, this banking union. Now, uh, in terms of um, the current discussion, um, I would say if we have just one element and the others are not there or poorly designed, the whole thing won't work. Now, this doesn't mean we shouldn't start the discussion as we have it uh, with the single supervisory mechanism. Which, I mean, I think it is justified chronologically to start with a common supervision. Uh, yet, it must be clear that very quickly after the common supervision, we will have, and we are making the plans now, on the common resolution and the common fiscal backstop. Now, um, doing just one is inconsistent. Just think about the ECB being the supervisor for all the banks in the Eurozone. Um, finding out after five years uh, there's a big problem in a bank in, in country X, and then it will basically tell the national authorities, by the way, we are withdrawing the banking license for that bank because it's, this bank is not, not, not properly done. But please, you guys, you take care of the problem. Uh, it's not going to work. Um, the national resolution and the national authorities will resist this, and they will say, well, you screwed it up in Frankfurt, you didn't supervise us properly, and now we have to pay the bill. That's, that's inconsistent, it, it won't work. Um, uh, doing just the fiscal backstop without actually the resolution tools, I think, is not going to work um, as well. Um, you cannot expect from taxpayers to pay um, for banks in other countries without even having the tools to reduce the costs for the taxpayers. And every national resolution authority will have every incentive to impose as little costs on their uh, domestic creditors and as, as much costs on the, on the federal, uh, on the federal uh, fiscal backstop. Okay. Now, the discussion on the single supervisory mechanism, where do we stand? Um, well. I think we have a, a, a pro proposal by the, co by the European Commission, um, which is based on Article 127.6. Now, the legal base um, has been chosen not even by the European Commission, but uh, by the heads of state. Um, the legal base um, has significant disadvantages, but, well, that's what we have currently, and so I think we should currently move ahead with this. Um, but we should be aware that there are very significant di disadvantages. Now, let me talk first about the pros. I think the pros of the Commission proposal are that basically you have very broad powers given to the, to the ECB, both in terms of information, remedial action, and uh, the power to, to actually withdraw a banking license. So what we have here, the proposal really is a, a major step forward towards the centralization of uh, decision-making power in the Eurozone. Um, so it's a major, um, a major sovereign, a sovereign right that is actually being pushed from a national level to a federal level. And in that sense, it's a really big step towards federalization. Um, it is also important that the Commission proposal covers all banks. Now, the, the, the real disadvantages of that, that proposal um, are, are, I think, threefold. First of all, the governance of the decision-making process as such is... <coughs> Is, is not really um, uh, the best one. First of all, it's the governing council of the ECB that has to, be t has to take the ultimate decisions, which means all the national central bank governors plus the European uh, Central Bank Executive Board. Um, this means all other countries that want to join the mechanism in Eastern Europe uh, are left out from the final decision making. Um, this, this also means that um, some, at least some people in my country are very, in Germany, are very concerned that the governors will, will basically uh, make supervisory decisions with monetary policy decisions. Now, I think this, this concern is really overstated in Germany, but uh, you know, that's, that's the German debate. I mean, I think ultimately, um, uh, monetary policy decisions will always um, uh, take, have a look at least at what is happening in the banking system. I mean, that's, that's, that's absolutely natural. The idea that the monetary policy decisions can be taken completely independently from, from banking decisions, I think, is overstated. But um, my, my country folks, uh, my, my country compatriots uh, really see this as a big concern. Um, but I have to say this, um, this is also surprising because 
um, the decision in June was to go for Article 127, and uh, in this decision basically uh, meant that it was going to be the ECB, and, and one cannot say that uh, people have been unaware of the fact that 127 means the ECB. So, um, so this decision has been taken, so I think we need to go forward with this. Okay. Um, now, there's a big debate about which banks should be covered and so on. Um, now, I think in principle we should go for all 6,000. Now, what is important, I think, is that the real supervisory power and the real supervisory action for the biggest 200 banks is really centralized. If you cover the biggest 200 central banks in the uh, the 200 banks in the the biggest 200 banks in the eurozone, you basically cover more than 95 percent of of the assets uh, uh, that are out there in the banking system in the eurozone. So so you know I I understand that we should insist on all 6,000, but let's get for the 200 biggest. Let's get at least for those 200 biggest. Let's get really the power. Uh, and the actual supervisory authority centralized. Okay. Now, the second point uh, is about the fiscal resources, which I think is an absolutely crucial point. Um, now, of course, good resolution aims at minimizing the costs to the taxpayers by preserving economic and financial stability. That is very much what the Europe European Commission is trying to do. Uh, they put up a, a, a proposal on, on bank resolution and implicitly hope that um, this will mean there will be no taxpayers' money anymore. Now, I, I just think this is, this is a, a very laudable attempt, but not very realistic. Uh, de facto, um, fiscal costs, um, I mean, banking, major banking crisis always cost, uh, cost the taxpayer money, and, uh, and the, the amount of cost is really significant. And if we, if we think this significant cost should be borne by the national taxpayers exclusively, we are not going to be able to break this link between sovereigns and banks. So we need to have a risk-sharing mechanism for um, basically the big fiscal costs. And let, just to illustrate what I mean with this, uh, I plot here the, um, the distribution of fiscal costs, uh, so the tax cost to the taxpayers, of financial crisis, big banking crisis in history. Um, this are, these are 60 or 70 crises that are plotted here. A and what you see is that, of course, half of the crisis, 50% uh, of the crisis, cost between 0 and 5% uh, to the taxpayer. But that also means there's a very significant distribution of, uh, of countries out here and of crises out here, which cost much, much more to the taxpayer. And of course, one. One big example is, is Ireland, which is uh, in, this, in this group here, 40%. Uh, and, and of course, we see currently in Ireland that um, the, the cost of the bank bailout make it very difficult uh, for, the, for the government to, to regain market access and so really um, drives this link between banks and sovereigns. And, and you know, if you want to break this in the future, we really need to basically go for these big risks. Um, now. Then I, I think one point that, that I, I do want to mention is the, the incentives. Um, of course, if we provide a common insurance, we need to think about what does it mean in terms of incentives. We shouldn't take this lightly. Um, burden sharing arrangements need to be made before the cost occurs. You need for it to get the incentives right. You need the centralized resolution and supervision. And I do think, and that's, that's a new point here, I do think we cannot have a system where all the fiscal costs are centralized. I mean, that's, that's not possible. Um, there are too many national policies that have an impact on bank risk other than banking policies. Um, so I think we do need to keep the national taxpayer on the hook, but not you know, for the full bill. That's, that's not, not acceptable. Um, um, anyway, sorry. OK, so then, then uh, of course, there's the issue of, of the legacy, um, which um, is, of course, the most interesting being in Dublin. Uh, now, uh, let, let, me, let me start by saying the, the, um, the I guess the first point is uh, waiting is really very costly. I mean, not solving the banking crisis as we do currently in Spain and in many other countries is really increasing the overall cost. So um, there is really a case to be made. We need to solve the banking problems as quick as possible because otherwise growth, uh, everything will be weak and... and uh, uh, economic activity will be weak. I think we can really say that, that Europe in many respects is now entering 
uh, into some form of Japanese uh, Japanese disease. So, so, so that's really it's really an issue, and and we should we should address this. Now, the second point is uh, a kind of a principle, which is of course legacy problems in principle should be for those that have been responsible. Um, that is uh, that is a principle that you have in every insurance. Um, you get the insurance only after uh, after a, a screening, a health a health check uh, screening. Now, I think there's exceptions that should be granted. Um, and, uh, and there I differ very much with um, the current German position, or at least the, German, the position by some people in Germany, um, uh, which, uh, which I think, I mean, first of all, when government solvency is endangered, we should understand that it's much more costly to, to endanger uh, government solvency than to, to allow for direct uh, support for banks. I think we can also argue that there has been a system failure um, before um, uh, before this crisis, certainly there was regulatory arbitrage and so on. So there's, I think, a real case to be made um, for, for, for burden sharing, um, even of the legacy costs. Now, um, I guess uh, you will have on, on your mind uh, what I think, uh, whether, whether Germany is going to agree to uh, the ESM eventually taking over some of the Irish, um, Irish debt. Um, uh, resulting from the from the bank uh, bank recap. Now, um, to be honest, I think in the current framework, it's not going to be possible. The ESM uh, implementation law in Germany says very explicitly um, the ESM uh, resources cannot be used for bank recapitalization. So there's an explicit clause in the in the German, German law uh, in this German law. Um, and I don't see currently, at least, the uh, um, the uh, the government going uh, again to the Bundestag and trying to pass a modification of the German implementation law of the ESM. So I don't see the ESM as a as a way, uh, at least not before the elections. After the elections, with a big coalition, grand coalition, they may decide to to have a change in the ESM implementation law. But I don't see it happening before 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 the election. Now, what I could see is I could see uh, a solution um, which will be kind of accepted, which will go via um, the, the central bank, the euro system. The euro system actually, yes, so I'll, I'll finish in one minute. The euro system actually um, providing, providing direct help. Um, now, of course, the Bundesbank will oppose this, but um, uh, I think Berlin may, may accept it. But, uh, okay, this I don't Okay, so um, let me conclude. Um, the banking union is central to end this crisis. The current banking union plan is just about the single supervisory mechanism, and therefore it is incomplete. I think ultimately we need an agreement on the resolution and on the fiscal burden sharing. So we need more federalization, basically, of, of what's going on in, in the Eurozone. And of course, that also means that banking union is also a political project that cannot be separated from political integration including with more parliamentary control, the kind of things we are talking about, even the supervision uh, means that we need some form of parliamentary control of uh, those people that will take these uh, supervisory decisions. And I think the current proposals are still very far away from, from what we need, but at least there's a bit of momentum that we go in this direction. Thank you very much. <laughs>